Naples was a sleepy little beach town dominated by retirees when my dad moved us there in 1972. We lived just a couple houses off the beach and a short walk to the Naples Pier which is where I spent most of my time. Fishing and surfing was it for me. There wasn't much else to do back then. Some liked to go four-wheeling on the edge of the swamp. Once a year, they held the Swamp Buggy Races, where the big boys got to play in the mud. The day before, they would have the Swamp Buggy Parade march all the way down US 41, then turn down 5th Avenue, and end at 3rd Street. I don't think they do it anymore. By the way, that's my sister on the left in the back with her friends as one of the Raisinettes. For those that didn't want to get down and dirty, we had a go-kart track out in East Naples, and that was fun for a while till it shut down, probably because of all the headaches we caused them. Some of the guys built a pretty rad half pipe, and that was a blast to skate when it wasn't too hot out. A few of my friends had boats, and we'd take them out for a day of wake surfing, which was much more agreeable in the brutal summer heat than skating that half pipe. Well, I did it all back then. The beach and the pier was the center of my universe. Having a solo frisbee catch on one of the many, many days when the surf was flat, or photographing a model on my favorite picturesque stretch of beach down by Port Royal were just a few of the things I liked to do. Walking my dog to the end of the street for a surf check whenever I saw the palm fronds begin to move was a regular ritual that often ended with a surf session. Here I am surfing the Naples Pier in the late 1980s.
after watching the video, there are probably two things that stand out to you, and no, I'm not talking about my legs. One might be how I try and ride every wave all the way to the beach. I wanted to get the most out of each ride, and that includes riding the whitewater if that's what it takes to get it all. As surfers, we tap into the wave's energy the moment it breaks and use the face of the wave to guide our surfboards down the line. I aimed for a complete ride, which means there was nothing left of the wave to ride on and the energy that was available to me had been harnessed. Watching the rest of this video, you'll see that nobody else out there was getting longer rides than me or catching more waves than me. Which brings us to the other thing you might have noticed. I was riding some really crappy surfboards. They were hand-me-downs friends gave me to ride, and the longboard made catching waves a lot easier, hence the higher wave count. They were super heavy and hard to ride, but for me it was a challenge that I happily accepted. It wasn't until 1990 when I finally got a brand new longboard, and it was a dream to ride, especially when I'd go over to the east coast and ride it on some bigger waves. Being the only longboarder out in the lineup at the pier, I really tried to not be a wave hog, but it's hard when I can pretty much catch every wave and ride it all the way in. We're starved for waves. So every wave should be ridden, and no waves should be wasted. Giving a wave to someone in a better position, and then watching them blow it knowing I could have ridden it all the way to the sand can be frustrating. But we were all friends out there, and everyone should get at least one chance. Another thing you may have noticed was the lack of girls out there surfing. When I graduated Naples High in 1975, the town was seriously lacking in girls that liked to hang out at the pier, and there definitely wasn't any that were interested in learning how to surf. Moving on to the 1980s and as the town began to grow, the pier became the place to hang out, and the south side at 13th Avenue was the hot spot. It was packed during the day all the way to sunset. More and more girls were beginning to take interest in us surfers, and sometimes it was a good thing to lose your board all the way to the beach so you had to retrieve it. Then one day, April decided she wanted to learn how to surf, so I gave her a few quick lessons and she was up and riding in no time. While she wasn't the first girl to surf in Naples, she probably put more time in the water than any others to that date. She would join the guys in the lineup and catch her fair share of waves. Didn't hurt that her boyfriend was also a surfer, and he kept her pointed in the right direction. There was enough waves for everyone, and we were all having fun.
focused on the north side of the pier, but the south side got plenty of waves too. A lot of different factors determine which side of the pier is breaking best on any given day of waves, but generally speaking, the south side was best on waves produced by cold fronts. The north side would be a lot bigger but usually disorganized with a strong rip trying to pull you into the pier. The south side benefited from the pier blockage, which made the waves smaller but with better form, and sometimes you could get block-long rides. On those rare occasions when we got a swell from a tropical disturbance, the situation kind of reversed with the south side having the bigger waves. All that really mattered was getting some rideable surf and we didn't care if it was on the north side or the south side. We were just happy to have some waves.
be fun. Awesome. Gonna be killer. What are you gonna do? First of all, I'm gonna run over some surfers. <laughs> Just one or all of them? Oh, uh, those are my buoys out there. Uh huh. We'll see how it goes. Hey, we put the camera on board.
Excuse me, when's the last time you went surfing? Last time a hurricane hit Naples? It's very difficult to tell what casualties will be because until the people can get out and assess what exactly has happened, there's no way of knowing who may have decided to try to stick this out at the beach. Check in with Spencer Christian right now, see what the latest is on this hurricane. Spence? All right, Mike, once again, a satellite view of the storm as it uh, moved across the southern tip of Florida, just south of Miami is where it hit land. Of course, it's about to move uh, and exit the land areas now, move out to sea in the Gulf of Mexico. Highest sustained winds around 145, 140 miles per hour. The uh, highest wind gust reported 165 miles per hour. And uh, as you know, there's been extensive flooding already. The projected path of the storm is uh, across the Gulf and up towards the uh, Louisiana coast. But of course, we don't know that yet for sure. That's just the way things look at the moment. These are the areas that have been hardest hit by the storm on the east coast from uh, Vero Beach down to Miami and then up the west coast up to Venice, which will be even harder hit as the storm approaches the west coast. And of course, you can expect in the areas hardest hit by the storm, five to 10 inches of rainfall. And uh, as I said, about 140 mile per hour wind gusts in the areas where the winds are their strongest. Uh, the national outlook calls for mostly sunny skies over the remainder of the eastern half of the U.S. Warm and humid conditions, very summer-like. That's a look at the national weather. Here's a look at the weather where you are. Good morning. I'm meteorologist Gordon Barnes. Uh, Hurricane Andrew is located about 75 miles to the southeast of my, uh, Naples, I should say, moving on a westerly course, and about 11 o'clock should be located south of Marco Island. More details later. On August 23, 1992, Hurricane Andrew made landfall at Elliott Key as a Cat 5 and moved fairly quickly across Florida before entering the Gulf of Mexico just below Marco Island in the afternoon as a Category 4 hurricane. Now the eye wall, the north part of the eye wall, that's where the most extreme wind conditions estimated by the National Hurricane Center at 140 miles an hour just to the south of Marco Island, so I would not be surprised at all to hear about Marco Island having winds in excess of 100 miles an hour even as we speak in places like Everglades City and Chokoloski having a, a very serious problem right now, not only because of wind, but rising tide. And we need to talk about this rising tide problem as well. What's going to happen as this storm continues moving west and into the Gulf of Mexico, the same counterclockwise swirl that for the moment is keeping the tides back will send a surge of water toward 
the coastline and we're most concerned about Collier County where we could see a rise in the tide, a storm surge to the order of 7 to 11 feet. But that won't happen until this storm gets a little farther out and it can turn the winds around to more of a southerly direction. Again, wind is the big problem, especially in Collier County. Storm surge is the big problem, especially in Collier County, or it will be developing a little bit later on this afternoon. I rode the storm out at home, and as soon as it entered the gulf, I grabbed my surfboard and headed to the pier. I begged my brother to come to the pier with my video camera to record us surfing, but he wouldn't bother. The rain had nearly subsided with just a few intermittent bands coming through, and the wind didn't know if it wanted to be onshore or offshore, so the waves were kind of glassy with the tops getting blown off. There was already a few people in the water and lots of onlookers on the beach. The waves were huge, without a doubt the biggest I'd ever seen in Naples. Long lines and it was well overhead. The waves were breaking way past the end of the pier and there was just enough south angle to the swell making the lefts break really nice. The current was strong going to the north, so Brett, the guy you just watched wreck on his bicycle, and I walked several blocks south of the pier to paddle out. It wasn't that hard to make it out to the lineup, and when I finally sat on my board I took a look around to note our position. We were sitting at the street end that was four blocks south of the pier and maybe 60 or 80 yards past the end of the pier. I remember turning to Brett and telling him this was the farthest I'd ever been out. A set came through and I took off on the second wave and dropped in on my longboard. The wave was well over my head and I went left heading towards the pier. It had a nice wall for a bit and then closed out so I straightened out and rode the whitewater for a while till the wave hit the sandbar that's past the concession stand on the pier and it walled up again and I headed left towards the pier again. The wave closed out again and I rode the white water again until the wave hit the sandbar that's beach side of the concession stand and reformed for the last time. I kept going left this time riding it all the way to the beach and stepped on the sand like you saw me do earlier in this video. I turned around to look at where I had come from and realize that I had just got the longest ride on a surfboard in Naples. Starting four blocks south of the pier and 80 yards past the end and riding one wave continuously till I stepped off at the foot of the pier. In my 50 years of being around the Naples Pier, I can't think of any other time when that feat would have been possible. Eventually I'll do a video of that day and map out my course for a better understanding as to just how far I traveled. A couple shots with my drone would be a nice touch. Maybe I can get Brett on camera to recollect that day. I surfed all afternoon till my arms couldn't take it anymore and then rode my bike home, got something to eat, and then rode back with my video camera to capture what was left of the swell. Someone said all the trees had blown over at the Beach Club golf course, so I went by there real quick to get some video. By the time I got back to the pier, the waves had really dropped in size, and there was no wind at all. There was still a few guys out, including Brett's brother, Mike, and he was catching a lot of waves on his longboard. On any given day, the waves we're looking at now would be considered in the good to excellent range for the Naples Pier, but the waves I experienced earlier in the day was one for the record books. It was an eventful day for sure. I started in the morning worrying if we were going to take a direct hit from a Category 5 hurricane and lose everything. Then I watched the weather on TV to see when it entered the gulf so I could go to the pier. Then, catching the biggest waves I'd ever seen in Naples. Then watching the surf dwindle down to three foot glass before dark. 
August 23, 1992 was all time at the Naples Pier, but I've had plenty of other good times surfing there with my friends. I'll finish my story with a look at some more of the 80s surfing, with a bit of the early 90s thrown in for a look at the next crop of surfers out there getting ready for a chance at the record books. Thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoyed this story from one photographer's life. This Nick, a fucking hero. He was catching so many fucking waves and snaking everybody, putting everybody to shame. What kind of maneuvers? Fucking off the lips, fucking aerial 360 rail grabs, fucking fin first, fucking aerial 360s. His hair would be in front of his face and he'd still catch the waves, man. So then he said, let's go to the buggy and have a couple of mudslides. How's he gonna get home? Skateboard. I've seen it before, it turns truth into lies.